Um, hello everyone, I'm Shu Wenden from Yale University. Today I'm going to introduce our work named a benchmark box width for evaluating caches vulnerability to timing attacks. This is a joint work with Wen Jiexiong and Professor Jakub Zephyr, also from Yale University. Um, so first of all, I'd like to introduce something about cache timing side channel attacks. Uh, we know recently there are spectral meltdown and foreshadow attacks. They try to exploit um, the fundamental design flaws existing in the near all the processors. And for these type of attacks, most of them use the cache time inside channels. So in this case, we really need to understand how caches are vulnerable to timing channels in order to further prevent these attacks. So in our threat model, we have an attacker and the victim. The victim is the one that holds a critical, a critical data, and the attacker tries to learn the data. For the attacker, we assume that it has the ability to monitor the timing of the cache operations um, made by the victim or by the self. And it can control or trigger the victim to do some operations using sensitive data. For the attacker's goal, obviously, it wants, he wants to uh, learn the physical address or index of victim sensitive data by observing the timing difference of a cache access. Um, and for our work, we're focusing on L1 data cache attacks, uh, timing attacks, but um, our framework can be further extended to other cache levels or other cache-like structures. Um, so here is an example of one type of uh, cache timing side channel attacks. It's, its name is Prime and Probe. It requires three steps. So in first step, a attacker tries to prime each cache side so now you could see that in the cache, in the set associative cache, now all the entries are taken by the, the attacker. And then in the second step, the victim tries to access some critical data. So you could see this color data are now brought into the cache and possibly evict some attacker's data. And then in the final step, a attacker tries to probe each cache set again and then measure its timing. So in this case, if it finds that there are some cache set that got longer timing, it means um, the second uh, step's victims access the data actually maps to the same cache set as what attackers uh, accessed before. So he knows some partial address, which is a cache index of the victim. Okay. So actually, there are a lot of many different type of attacks. But for the defenders, the most important thing is that we need to understand all the possible type of attacks in order to fully prevent the security of our, of our, of our system. Um, so our recent three-step model, uh, we, did, uh, we derived that to be used to understand these all type of cache timing attacks. Um, and for this work, we present a security benchmark suite based on a three-step model uh, where we consider some real modeling on cases of the processors and create the benchmarks and the security evaluations um, to evaluate the system security. Okay, so let's get deep into now, uh, have some knowledge about this CAS three step model. Um, so the, this model is derived based on two observations. First, all existing cache timing attacks are within three memory operations. And then cache replacement policy, a policy re applies the same to each cache block. So in this case, we derived the three step model um, in first step, we have the initial state that will be set in the cache block um, by, a, uh, by a memory operation. And then in the second step, there could be some further memory operation that possibly alters the state of the cache that are set in the first step. And then in the final step, the, there are some final operations done and attacker will try to observe uh, the timing of the final step. So um, this is a typical cache uh, structures that we target on. And especially we focus on one target cache line here, we label it, uh, it black. Um, and then for the memory region, we assume the attacker um, is able to know some, some sets of the sensitive region X, which could possibly contain you know, some secret data like the AES lookup table. And then for the other regions, we just label it non-sensitive region. Um, so for a typical state of the three-step model, the left-hand side uh, could be either V or A, which is either victim or attacker, which represents who does access. And then in the uh, right bottom side, um, it is the actual state that uh, actual state as a result of the operation. And if this kind of state is a result of some invalidation, then we will have some inf that are labeled on the um, top right side to indicate it. it's actual inv invalidation of a state. So having uh, so what kind of state do we have? For read or write access, um, if it's an address, if it tries to access an address known to the attacker that maps to the cache block, and if it's within the sensitive memory region, uh, we call it A, and it could either be brought in by the victim or attacker. Um, 
So now you can see that it, ma it, ma uh, it shows that it maps to the cache block, target cache block. Um, or it could be A alias, which means it's some mm -hmm. data that are different from A, but also within the sense of origin X and it maps to the same target cache block. Um, for the case that uh, the data is outside of the sense of memory region, we label it a D to, ma uh, to represent some data that still um, maps to target cache line, but outside of the sense of region. Um, further, if they try to access some data address that are unknown to the attacker, which represents a WebKim secret, we use U, which means unknown, um, to represent this kind of state. And because the the, uh, the attacker just does not have uh, have no knowledge of, of uh, at all about this um, access, so it could be a, a alias or not in block, which means um, some data that actually does not map to the target cache entry. Okay. So um, on the other side, we have um, the corresponding validation-related um, states that, uh, um, that also you know, targets on the corresponding state and uh, represents an invalidation of that kind of state. Further, um, some uh, invalidation state could also mean um, to invalidate all possible addresses like this V invalid or A invalid. And for the th third type, we have kind of an unknown state where you start to represent it. Basically, means attacker has no knowledge at all about this uh, kind of state. So um, we have in total 17 states for each step, and we could derive further uh, 5, 000, uh, around 5,000 possible three-step combinations. Um, and in some following slide, we will introduce um, all the possible timing observations we derive for the R1 cache attacks. There are in total 66 types. So taking them as an input, we further derive a cache three-step simulator and some reduction rules uh, to derive all the effective vulnerabilities. And uh, it turns out there are 88 possible strong type vulnerabilities. Um, so these are shown in the, in the table. Um, from the table, we could see that there are a lot of different types. They map to uh, some existing um, attacks like cache collision, flush reload, etc. But more, more importantly, this colored or circled um, or vulnerability types, there are actually some new vulnerabilities. Um, so they, that includes some vulnerabilities we found in our uh, three-step model paper and also this, uh, from this new paper because of modeling the real processors. Um, and further, these vulnerabilities can be exploited to uh, trigger some real attacks in future design. Um, so in order to help us further understand the, understand the vulnerabilities, we categorize them into first either internal or external vulnerability. So the internal vulnerability means the, the type that only involves victims, victim's behavior in step two and step three. And then uh, the rest are the external vulnerability. And we also categorize into address-based vulnerability, which means uh, some types that can derive the cache line address of the victim, like the whole cache line address of the victim by observing the cache hit. So um, here we have an example. If u is equal to a, it actually um, will derive some cache timing observation that is equal to access the local L1 data. Otherwise, uh, he will only derive some cache timing observation uh, that is equal to accessing the data that is in the DRAM. So from this timing observation, he, he was able to know, um, you know the full uh, cache line address uh, of the U. I, I, or the second type we call it a set-based vulnerability. It means uh, the, 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 ad, the attacker can know the map side of the U by conflicting and generating eviction between the U and other data addresses. Uh, so we further have this example, which you know, uh, from the timing difference, um, he could either uh, derive a validation of local L1 L2 data timing or local L1 data timing so that he got um, the cache side of this U actually is equal to A or alias cache side. Um, the third type is actually uh, quite interesting. Uh, we call it set-based or address-based vulnerability, which means it can derive information from both ways depending on the actual timing difference. So for this example, if A and U maps to the same cache side, it actually be belongs to some cache side uh, vulnerability types um, behaviors. Mm -hmm. Um, or um, if A maps to U, then in this case, if we implement step one, two, and three uh, with different access, either read or write, uh, we could um, you know, uh, derive, different timing, uh, derive different time difference and further get the full address of the, of the U. Um, some prior work uh, categorized them as hit or miss based vulnerability, but we don't think it actually uh, applies to our, uh, all of our, of our vulnerabilities because we found 
some vulnerabilities, uh, both of these two timing observations belong to misfit vulnerabilities. In that case, uh, it's actually um, cannot be categorized in this hate or misfit vulnerability. Okay, so now let's try to see how we model the real processes. Um, so for the memory access timing, we consider not just fast or slow, which are the two possible timings. Uh, instead, we have 66 types. I, I will show you in the next slide. Um, and for um, actual attacks, for the attacker victim, we consider them uh, running in both uh, the hyper-threading way or time-sizing way. Um, and for an access operation, it could either be read or write. For an um, invalidation-related operation, it could either be flush or you know, uh, using remote write to invalidate some local data address. Um, so in total, we derived 1094 cases of benchmarks for all these ADA strong type of vulnerabilities. Um, so here uh, we show some examples of uh, the 66 types of timing uh, observations we derived and uh, when, we, uh, when we try to see the, their histograms on a specific process, which here is the Intel Axiom E5-1620 uh, processor. So um, the first graph shows the timing of read access uh, and, and its related types, and then there's the timing of write access, and the final graph is the timing of flush operation. And we also have um, some experiments on another processor, which is the uh, 2690 um, Intel processor. So um, from these two graphs, uh, these two sets of graphs, we could derive some takeaway messages. So first, many timings, they can be distinguished, but not just hit and miss. And secondly, writes actually ex exhibit some timing difference that can be used for attacks, but not just rates. Um, thirdly, is that the remote write, they have the timing difference that can be leveraged for the flush-like uh, attacks. And the final takeaway message is timing is process specific and some attacks, they may not work on all the processors. In this case, we could use this timing type histogram as actually a fingerprint for different processors. Okay. So to implement the benchmarks, um, here are some things that we want to highlight. Um, first, we use some statistics models. Here is the watches t-text to distinguish the distributions of measured timings. Um, so if we judge a vulnerability to be effective, it requires one of the three candidates uh, for you um, that to have timing distribution that are statistically different from others. And secondly, we use the RDTSC instruction to measure timing. Um, so to minimize noise, we isolate cores to reduce software noise, to reduce false uh, positives, and then to re for, for reducing neg false negatives, uh, you know, we, we choose more cache blocks to, um, to reduce the ratio of the system noise, and we repeat and measure more, and we use fans to enforce some other constraints. I think um, the last point is actually most interesting is that we find the access time of different cache sites, they are not the same. So in this case, if the last step is victims unknown step to remind you what the victims unknown step is, with, which, which actually could map to different cache sites, then we will repeatedly uh, access the last step and it's, uh, measure its timing. To, 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 got, to get the reference of the cache here timing for different cache sets um, so that we could minimize some noise you know, from different cache sites. Um, so further, we write the Mantis C program to automatically generate the binaries for each of these 1094 cases of the benchmarks. Um, so here is, is an example of the generated uh, benchmark code for one type of vulnerabilities. Um, so in this code, uh, we will first like initialize the data array and you know the mutex to synchronize to sequence the steps, and then we have the uh, remote and the local hardware and uh, victim threat. So they could uh, potentially implement the corresponding step one, two, three, and uh, the, the matter timing step uh, part for the step three. And in the last, uh, we implement, uh, we apply the watches t tax for different timing distributions to uh, see whether this vulnerability is effective or not. So for the evaluation results, this graph uh, on the axis, it shows uh, the 1 to 88 um, type of vulnerabilities. And on the y-axis, it shows the nine uh, different kinds of uh, processor configurations we use. Um, and the first and second line shows the OR and the end results of these processors. Um, so 
um, some conclusion we could derive is that the ATA effective vulnerabilities, they are mostly found in all the test CPUs. And the different machines, they are vulnerable to different type of attacks, you know, because of the end results are relatively scarce compared with the old result. We further derive a score called um, a cache timing vulnerability score, or CTVS, which represents the percentage of the vulnerabilities that are effective to for all the machine, that effective for the machine. Um, they are calculated by you know the vulnerability number of the corresponding processes vulnerable to uh, divided by the total cases of vulnerabilities. So um, for this score, the smaller scores means actually your processor is um, you know less vulnerable to the uh, timing um, cache timing side channel attacks. Um, so for this main city web score, we find that there is one type of the AMD machine that are actually has relatively smaller numbers. Um, further, we find the vulnerability types actually exhibit a pattern of the vulnerability. Um, so for uh, which we means the A type vulnerability, that, which the address type of vulnerability actually is mostly vulnerable to the processes. Then is the SA type vulnerability. Uh, the last is the S type or set type set based vulnerability. Um, so that is mainly because whether this time in, uh, this whether this timing difference between two types of, of, of observations or a specific type of vulnerability has is large or small actually will influence the effective rate. So if this time difference is large, for example, the A type, it will um, be more vulnerable to the processes. Otherwise, it can be like S type vulnerability, which will be less vulnerable. And further, we find the internal type and external type vulnerability, they are similarly effective to the cores and devices. That means, uh, or we could derive some takeaway messages that protecting only the external vulnerability is not enough. The internal vulnerability can be as effective as external vulnerability. Um, so for the access operation, we found you know, from the evaluation results is that the right access can be effective to implement the attack as well, but you know, relatively has smaller rate to trigger effective vulnerability compared with rate. And then for the invalidation, um, uh, uh, related operations, we found that the percentage of the vulnerabilities to which the machine is vulnerable uh, depends on the processor types. Okay, so um, so what can this CTVS score be used? It can be used to build some custom defenses, um, and then you know it can also be used to understand the limits of existing defenses using a three set model, which means that we could you know for example um, like. Uh, develop or create some new performance counter types uh, based on some new vulnerability types. Um, and it can further be used to understand the microarchitecture using the CTVS score. Um, so here I have an example, I will not go into detail, but the idea of that is that um, you know, from the difference of a specific vulnerability uh, between the two processors, we could further find you know, some inner reasons uh, due to the, the microarchitecture difference of these two processors. So to conclude, uh, we present the three-step model and benchmarks based on the, um, based on the model. We perform the, the modeling uh, of the real processes, you know, consider different rates, right, flush, or remote uh, to invalidate cases. And we implement the benchmarks and then evaluate the benchmarks on the real processes to, to find uh, you know, any like, usage we could derive from this benchmark. And the, the benchmark code will be open source and available at the following links um, and thanks for listening to this talk.